Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi. Wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu falamudhillala wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika la. Wa nashhadu anna sayyidina wa sanadina muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. Amma ba'd. فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين لا يرجون لقاءنا ورضوا بالحياة الدنيا واتمأنوا بها والذين هم عن آياتنا غافلون أولئك مأواهم النار بما كانوا يكسبون إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات يهديهم ربهم بإيمانهم تجري من تحتهم الأنهار في جنات النعيم صدق الله الأذين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك سيد الأولين والآخرين إمام الأنبياء والمرسلين محمد عبد الله المصطفى المجتبى النبي الأمي وعلى آله وأزواجه والصحبه أجمعين كما صليت وسلمت وباركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد I have been preparing this topic for a very long time and alhamdulillah, mashallah, I've been amazed at how much the ulama have written about the dunya. And those of you who heard last week, the last uh, times beyan, that was also about the dunya. Today, inshallah ta'ala, will also be about the dunya. And the reality is, is that there's so much, and mashallah, the barakah of all of you wanting to listen, prompting me to do this reading. Allahu Akbar, the ulama have written so much, and that's also a sign actually, more importantly, that there are so many ayat in Quran al-Kareem on this topic, and so many hadith of Nabi al-Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on this topic, and so many sayings. Of the Sahaba, Tabin, Taba Tabin, Siddiqin, Salihin, of this Ummah on this topic, that it's a very vast topic. And you know, I'm often told, especially in America, that you know, to keep things short. But <laughs> to be honest with you, Allah Akbar, I mean, I've benefited so much from the things that I've tried to read for today. Uh, it's actually min- maybe one of the most difficult times I have faced in doing selection for a presentation on a topic. It's really hard to omit anything from all that has been written on this topic. And I think not just the vast amount of information, but the tremendous need that we really need, the tremendous need for us to understand the dunya as our deen, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands it, as Sayyidina Rasulullah and the Sahaba Kiram radiallahu ta'ala anamajamain live their lives in the dunya. This is why that beautiful work, Hayatu Sahaba, is such a wonderful work because it shows the asceticism, it shows the lack, relative lack of effect that the dunya had on their hearts and their lives. And one thing that happened to me just shortly before starting, uh, and this happens to all of us from time to time in life, is you burn yourself very slightly. Sometimes on the kettle here, sometimes as it happened to me this morning on the toaster oven. It was literally a, it took one millisecond, one second, for this tiny burn, which I'm looking at, which could really be measured maybe in one centimeter or less in millimeters. And Allah Akbar, that one second, I yelped. And as all of us, alhamdulillah, mashallah, whenever this happens, we remember the fire of Jahannam. We remember the verses in Quran where Allah SWT mentions that He will burn people. Allah Akbar, Allahumma jinnah min nar such that their entire flesh, skin, will be burned off and then He will create for them a new, a new skin and flesh only to burn it off again. Allahu Akbar. And it made me realize, and I, I, since I brought this up, I will talk about it a little bit. Uh, but it made me realize 
that we often talk about the dunya in terms of making us forget akhira, but we take a particular angle on akhira and we say the dunya, the life of this world, makes us forget that our akhira, we want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we want to attain jannah, makes us forget our purpose of life. That is all true. But one of the things the dunya also makes us forget is the fire of jahannam. And this is why then, between this burn that took place shortly before 11, I wanted to find this ayah that I recited for you uh, because it connects this concept of dunya and the fire of jahannam. And so there's so much that has been mentioned in Quran al-Kareem and hadith and by the ulama about the dunya. And until maybe 10.30 a.m. my time, I had not planned to start with this. But I'm now going to start with this, that the dunya makes us forget jahannam. And then, in fact, as I recited to you in Quran al-Kareem, the dunya can make us enter into jahannam. How does the dunya? So dunya obviously makes us forget the akhir entirety but also makes us forget that there is a punishment if we don't behave properly in this dunya. Beyond just a slip or mistake and the cost that we might have to pay for that in this world, or beyond whatever pleasure or gain or prestige for which we do a sin, that pleasure and pain and that pleasure and prestige only belongs to the dunya. And we forget that not only is there going to be an akhirah, there will be a day of judgment, and that act of ours in our life, our hayat dunya our lifetime and our lived life in this world. Right? These are the words that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used in Quran al karim In the Ladina, so this is Surah Yunus, verses 7 onward. And here Allah subhanahu ta'ala is actually explaining the whole crux. That verily indeed those who do not yearn with hope and desire and longing to meet us, Allah subhanahu ta'ala is using the royal we means meet Allah subhanahu ta'ala in His royal majesty, in His might, in His splendor, in His beauty. So this is the first thing. First thing, this is actually the way we spend our time in this world. The entire life, let me finish. bil hayatid dunya, And instead, they are radhi. Now remember this word. This is a very important word in Quran al-Karim. Right? This is the word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses in the Quran for how we're supposed to feel about Him. And how He feels about us. Ideally. Radiallahu anhum wa radhu an. This is the great testimony Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made for all the Sahaba, Kiram, all the noble companions of the Blessed Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Quran al-Kareem. Radiallahu anhum, Allah ta'ala is radi with them, wa radhu an, and they are radi with him. But here, what is being mentioned in Quran al-Kareem by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that those who do not yearn with hope and longing to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and instead, wa radhu bil hayati dunya, hayati dunya. وَرَذُوا بِالْحَيَاتِ dunya. Instead they are radhi, they are happy, pleased, content with the life of the world, with the worldly life. This is, this is the ultimate delusion. Hmm? And then another huge word that Allah SWT uses in the Quran for huge other things. Here it's being used for what? What ma'annu means itminan. What ma'annu biha and they have itminan with ha means al hayat al dunya. They have itminan, they have serenity, peace, tranquility with the hayat al dunya, the life of this world. Allahu Akbar. It's the complete. It's a complete actual perversion. It's the complete opposite. Our raza was supposed to be based on Allah subhanahu wa taala. Our itminan was supposed to be based on the zikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means just the feeling of deep remembrance and awareness and constant connection and longing and yearning. Allah bi zikri Allah al kulub. And then the third sign that is mentioned about these people, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ أَنْعَيَاتِنَا غَافِلُونَ And they are those people who are ghafil, heedless, unaware, uncaring. So ghafil can mean you're unaware, or you're aware but you're uncaring. Right? So one level of ghafla is I don't even know. 
I'm so heedless, I'm unaware. This is mostly the state of the people who don't have Iman. And for those of us who have Iman, on the one hand it seems like a lesser, in terms of rational emotions, a lesser level of ghafla that we are at least aware, but we're uncaring. But at its worst, it's worse to be aware of the truth and not care about it, as opposed to a person who, poor soul, is not even aware of the truth in the first place. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ آيَاتِنَا غَافِلُونَ So ayat, you know, sometimes in Quran it means signs, sometimes it means the verses of revelation, many times it means both, because the verses of Quran are itself one of the, if not the greatest sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can take it to mean all of that. They are unaware, heedless. Again, I say for us, the way we will translate it for us, they're aware, but they're uncaring. Or to make it even stronger, they're completely aware, but yet they're completely uncaring. Allahu Akbar. Completely aware that Quran and Kareem is Kalamullah, the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but completely uncaring. Completely aware that Salah is Fard, but completely uncaring. Don't bother to pray Salah. Hmm? How many Muslims are like that in this world? al aman al We would be just like them. Hmm? Hmm? In fact, some of them become so uncaring, they become actually unaware. They're aware about there's something called halal and haram, but they're uncaring. Now when you, this is all just one verse, right? This is all just verse 7. These three things are related. I will come back to this. I want to take a second look at this. But just to finish the part about the Jahannam, so that's the next ayah. Ula'ika ma'wahumun These are those people. Rather, we would say they are those people. Ma'wahumun. Ma'wa is their dwelling, their abode, their residence, their destination, their homeland, Allahu Akbar, will be an-nar, the fire. Why? Bimakanu yaksibun, because of all the things they used to commit. So kanu, if you remember, kanu, kana, the verb kana is coming on mudara here, it's for istimrar, it's for the, it, because of the entire lifetime of all the things they committed while living in al hayat dunya because, now go back to that verse, because they spent their entire life, number one, la yarjuna liqa'ana, they had no yearning desire, want to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two, waradhu bil hayat dunya they were radhi. Instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they were radhi with the life of this world. What ma'annu biha? Number three, they had itminan in it. Hmm? And number four, they were unaware or uncaring of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His creation and the verses of His revelation. So, now many things to be said here. First, it makes us realize that, look, if we want, if our approach to life, so the delusion part now, delusion number one. Yes, I have. So now I'm specifically talking about the delusions that people like you, anybody who would listen to a talk like this, right, would be, alhamdulillah, having iman and, you know, trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making a'mal saleh trying to do ibadah. Might, we might be struggling, we might be sinning, but overall, Alhamdulillah, we believe in Quran Karim, believe in the Sunnah of Nabi Karim, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, etc. Trying to improve our ibadat, our a'mal, our akhlaq, etc. So I'm going to talk about the delusions you and I have. I'm not going to talk about, uh, and no doubt, this ayah is also primarily about the unbelievers. That's why I deliberately recited the next part of it, which is about the believers, alright? But many of us, the Ahl Iman, and this is a very standard understanding that those verses in Quran al-Kareem which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, yes, definitely revealed about the unbelievers, 
but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed details about their emotions, their attributes, their actions, and us, the Ahlul Iman, have to make sure that Alhamdulillah, fine, we may not have their disbelief or their unbelief, but we also have to make sure we don't have any of these emotions and actions. So that's why verses seven, verse 7 can very much apply to us. And then what are the, verse, what are the uh, feelings and actions we should have? That is going to come a little bit later in this talk, inshallah, in verse 9. And the reward for that, obviously, is going to then be promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse number 10. So what are those feelings and actions that unbelievers who have this at an absolute level, and us, we may have that. What is the delusion? So delusion number one. The delusion number one is that, look, I have to practice my deen. Alhamdulillah, I have to strive in that, struggle in that, inshallah, with the fadl and karam and hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I also, one of my aims in life is to have a life where I have itminan in this world. So everybody around me should be nice to me, loving to me, loyal to me. Everything at work should be going just fine. All my children should turn out exactly the way I wanted to. Everything in my marriage life should be just fine. And then if that doesn't happen, so that's the delusion because it's not going to happen. This life is not perfect. When that doesn't happen, a person gets frustrated. Sometimes a person gets frustrated with whatever the asbab are, the causes are, maybe the people. Sometimes a person gets frustrated with themselves. And sometimes a person gets frustrated with the deen. And sometimes a person gets frustrated, na'udhu billah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was a topic I gave once, years ago. So, getting frustrated with the deen, what happens in a subconscious way? May not always happen consciously. But subconsciously what happens, a person gives up. Gives up, not entirely but becomes slack in their ibadat and their a'mal. Why? Because this was delusion. They thought that if I start reciting Qur'an, learning Qur'an, memorizing Qur'an, understanding Qur'an, learning ilm, learning about the seerah, learning about the sunnah, trying to be better, doing tazkiyah, mujahidah, etc. This side of my life, the dunya, would have become a place of itminan for me. I wasn't doing it for that reason. I was doing it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was doing it out of ubudiyah, out of slavehood and submission. But still, I thought that also, secondarily, albeit secondarily, that my life in this world will also be settled and I would be happy and content. Radi and itminan. So no, actually... The life of this world, unless we put it into proper perspective, will never be a place. So this is the difference of perspective. So the unbeliever, and the other way then, another another angle on this verse of Quran al Karim, is that no, that the extreme level is that person who is so happy with this world that they're entirely oblivious. Maybe that's actually a better word for ghafla than heedless. They're entirely oblivious to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, deen, ahkam, the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, laws, teachings, values, ethics, nor all of it. But why? Because they're inherently bad people. No, they were created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the fitrah. And as we know in the hadith, Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa that every human being's internal fitrah will call them to Islam. It's because the dunya deluded them. The dunya made them feel it softened them up. It weakened their resolve. It deluded them into tricking them that this is your abode of radhan itminan. Now yes, alhamdulillah, the Ahl iman may not have this at an entire level, but sometimes we have it. So this is the second delusion, that sometimes when things are going okay in our life, it makes us slack in our deen. So everything you will find that Often it's, it's observed, we observe it in ourselves and in friends, that when a person is struggling, they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When a person is in crisis, they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa mentioned in Quran came several places, when you're in the ship and the storm comes, you make dua to me, when I bring you to the shore, you forget me, Allah Akbar. I'm giving a, just a simple rendering. So this is the second delusion. 
that the what it mean the delusion is that the world by default was a place where everything is fine in those strange circumstances when i'm disturbed i turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he helps me out of that disturbance and then i go back to the default of the world which is it's a wonderful place to live so this is a huge delusion huge delusion about the world that is at its essence and core a wonderful place to live and a delusion about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that my role with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just this, that He is going to uh, remove the disturbances in my life. Third delusion that we have about this. Now I'm going beyond this ayah now. So this was just the first part that I, I mean I mentioned I guess three things so far. The first delusion is that it makes us forget Jahannam itself, right? Uh, the second delusion is that we seek pleasures and prestiges in this world. Third is that we take this world as a place of radhan itminan. And fourth is when we have radhan itminan in this world, we become slack in our deen. Okay, so in that summary, I also mix things up a little bit. Gave you a bit of different ways to understand it. All right. Now moving past this verse, some other delusions of the life in this world. The next one is that our worth in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or our worth in our own eyes, which is actually the same thing. We have no worth except for the worth we have in the regard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But our worth, what we think our worth is, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or we think our worth is in our own self-conception is based on our achievements and our accomplishments. This is a delusion. No one should take any mm, pride in their achievements and accomplishments. No one should should think that because of their and I'm talking about dini I'm talking about deen, religious achievements and accomplishments no one should think that that gives them any worth in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Quran al-Karim la tuzakku anfusakum that don't you dare ever declare yourselves or deem yourselves to have been purified because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and in a hadith that Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu mentioned, I want you to think about this hadith. It is narrated by Imam Bukhari Rimalatala and Imam Muslim Rimalatala. And that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can sometime help the deen or support the deen through a person who is fajr. So Fajr means, so it's not Fasik, Fajr is a person who is a, a corrupt person. So they're corrupt in terms of their character, their virtue. You can think the opposite of Tazkiyah. Now, interestingly, Imam Bukhari Mulatala, he placed this hadith in Kitab al-Jihad. Allahu Akbar. Do you have to really sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but you know, it's always beneficial to think and to look at where the ulama of hadith place a hadith, in which chapter. So this is called Tarjimatul Bab. In other words, what is the Bab? What is the section? What is the part of that collection on hadith where they place the blessed words of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What does that mean? That even a person that does jihad, Allahu Akbar, this true, just, valid, virtuous jihad fi sabilillah, even that person may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is supporting the deen through them, even though they themselves are a fajir, a corrupt sinner. Hmm? So even the greatest of struggles for deen is no indication of our worth. Imam Muslim, where did he put this hadith? 
He put it in Kitab al-Iman. Allahu Akbar. What did he mean? He meant that one's Iman, I mean, at least this Hadith being placed there, contrary to, you know, the discussions we have when we study Hadith about our A'mal, a part of Iman, because otherwise, yes, Imam Muslim did believe so. But the placement of this Hadith in that section means that one's Iman is their inner condition, not their outer outward, apparent, visible services to deen. So this is the delusion some of us have, right? Uh, and I remember this hadith, alhamdulillah, many elders would teach this hadith to people to remind them that yes, due to the fragility of your own iman, you may need to do work of deen in order to keep yourself connected to deen. So that's like me and you. Second, due to the fragility of the Iman of the Ummah. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with an amana, such as knowledge or any type of learning of deen, then you must share that. Perhaps the one you share it with will benefit from it in ways that you never can and never would have. That is again you and me. But nonetheless, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses you or grants you some success in that work of deen, Remember this one hadith. And certainly Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim, Imam Ta'ala, I'm, they weren't people who just, they were not just, you know, scribes. They were people of hearts. I can only imagine the feeling, you know, when Imam Bukhari Imam Ta'ala was sitting there deciding where to put this hadith, don't you think he was feeling it about himself? That I'm a muhaddith and people come and learn hadith from me. I should think about this hadith. In fact, not just me, but even the greatest of acts, I'll put it in Kitab al-Jihad, Imam Muslim, when he was placing this hadith, don't you think he felt about himself that I'm a muhaddith, so many people learn hadith from me, but all I want to do is pass away from this world in a state of iman, and what is, what what guarantee can I think any of my services of deen can give me about iman? Iman is in my heart, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone knows whether I have iman or I have some hidden nifaq, Hidden hypocrisy. Hmm? That's why their lives were so beautiful actually. Because they weren't just scholars in, in a sort of a very dry academic sense. They were livers of hadith. They were guided by hadith. You know really the, the placement of these blessed teachings of Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam in different abwab. And this is also why there's repetition by the way. And people don't understand. They'll say why can't we have an abridged version of Bukhari, why are the hadith repeated? Allah Akbar, this wasn't a dry academic exercise. Imam Bukhari Ma'ala felt that this hadith was so relevant to this particular topic, he put it in that chapter, and he felt that it was also so deeply moving and important to this other topic, he put it in another chapter, and that's how you have to learn hadith. Why do we have this dry approach that we should have these sanitized like textbooks where we only have to see that hadith once? Allahu Akbar, I, I've never understood why people will get so irritated about repetition. Actually, we should be repeating these hadith so many times in our life. Yes, it may be a bit more of a lengthy process, but it's a more beneficial process. That's why I also was saying, I cannot come up with a short topic, especially on this topic of dunya, because it, it requires length. The amount that we need to know about this and understand this is immense. Okay, so the delusion was that our a'mal. So what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? What is the answer then? Inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. Yes, the taqwa is reflected in our actions and virtues and our deeds and our character and our interactions and we have to improve all of that as part of our taqwa. But ultimately what we need to check, so listen to this carefully, I'm sorry, I know, because I, I'm struggling to make a very long topic as concise as I can. So listen to this carefully. Maybe this will be a succinct point. So we will do all of those things, inshallah, as part of our taqwa. But how do we know we have to check our heart? Did improving my ibadah, improving my behavior, improving my relationships, did it improve the taqwa of my heart? 
Did it make me more aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did it make me more loving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Did it make me more fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is it just that, yes, my outward compliance with Sharia has increased? Which is, yes, a very important thing. But did my, out, my own outward compliance with Sharia, it might even be affecting other people's hearts, but did my own outward compliance with Sharia, did it affect my own heart? Hmm? And the test of this is when a person is alone, right? Or the test of this is, as you would say, between uh, a'mal, between acts. So at the simplest of between Fajr and Dhuhr, between Dhuhr and Asr, between a gathering and another gathering, for those who go to weekly gatherings, between Umrahs, between Ramadans, the in-between. Hmm? So yes, we have to work on all the compliance, all the compliance. But we have to see, is it changing me at all? So go back to that first verse that I recited. One thing that should happen, and this is really, I, I'm really stressing this because this is the level of which the dunya has sort of ensnared us and made us enamored of it. So first I will check, did those outward acts of compliance affect the taqwa of my heart? Second, have those outward acts of compliance changed my perspective on this dunya? Have they made me more inclined towards akhirah? Do I have this? Take out the la yarjuna lika. Because this is also a phrase Allah Subhanahu uses in Quran al-Kareem. Those who yearn to meet Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man kana yarju lika Allah. That person who is always yearning to meet Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you find that, no, I'm just a better practicing Muslim functionally, but it hasn't changed my heart, this is a problem. This means what? This is a way to test that, no, my heart is still stuck in dunya. Alhamdulillah, I learned about halal and haram. I'm doing halal, staying away from haram. But the inner condition is still content in this world. So this is a different disease. This is a different issue now. And we just work on it the same way, alhamdulillah, we worked on getting ourselves out of haram and confining ourselves to halal. We have to work on it. It's very important to work on it. The mission is not done yet. The mission is not completed until, and this is really hard to do the second part because the world deludes us. So the ulama, they used to, and, I, and, and I'm not presenting that material to you today because it is very intense. Uh, but you should read these things. And actually, really, these topic, these presentations are really just to encourage everyone to learn more about these topics. One way the ulama used to talk about this was a term they used in Arabic called dham ad-dunya. Dham means uh, to sort of like blame the world or the blameworthiness of the world or reprimanding the world or you know, condemning the world. And people, most audiences, have very, not all you maybe, but if you wanted to give this in general talk in a masjid, they don't like this topic, right? And especially if one was to start quoting, so Ibn Abi Dunya in his work, Imam Ghazali uh, in his work, you know, Alhamdulillah, Majmain and all the ulama have written about this at length. It's very strong, Allah Akbar. But you know, maybe if you, we would not be able to have originally thought of that, but really, I mean, they, and to use simple English, they blast the dunya so hard. It's good. It shakes. It shakes a person up. It shakes a person up, and it also is amazing because I don't believe these ulama to have anyway been hypocrites. I also think that really, these were people of who I view to be people of taqwa and a'mal, and this is the way they viewed the world. This is the way. They viewed the world. And then there's so much Arabic poetry that, mashallah, these are two works, by the way. Ibn Abi Dunya has a work called Dhamad Dunya. Imam Ghazali Matala Ahyalumuddin has a kitab called Kitab Dhamad Dunya. Right? These are the two like classic works on this topic in our in our uh, Ilmi tradition. Allahu Akbar. Ajib, the things that they write. I'm just going to quote you a few things. Uh, so, number one. So this is Imam al-Ghazari. Know that this world is swiftly fading away 
soon to elapse into nothingness. Although it promises permanence. So what he means is baka here. Although it promises baka, it's actually completely funny. Okay, it means that yeah, even though the world presents itself as if this life is the be-all and end-all of your life, right? al hayat dunya Actually, before you know it, death will overcome you. And especially if you have somebody who was close to you pass away, I think it impacts your understanding of death much deeper than just this abstract remembrance of death. So as you grow older in life, you will start having people who were near to you and dear to you pass away, one after the other after the other. You will pass away, I will pass away, all of our parents will pass away, some of us, half of us, but statistically, yes, half of us, our spouse will pass away before us. A few of us will be unfortunate tragedy that our children might pass away before us. Hmm? And then you'll realize, because and that's a very important, that is why uh, dhikr al maut remembrance of death, is, connect, is connected to preparation for the akhirah. Because when you realize that somebody else's life, in other words, the deceased, the person who's passed away, is finished, with, you realize life was temporary. Whereas you thought it was going to be forever. You thought you would always be with that person. So this is actually one of the blessings uh, of the lessons of death that we have to make sure we learn and heed when that near person passes away from us. Is yes, their time with us was temporary because their time on earth was temporary because our time also on earth is temporary. And we will also be separated from those that we love and leave behind by the process of death. So if there's anything that we want to do or say uh, or share or feel before we pass away with our near and loved ones, we should be sure to do that sooner. A second thing he writes about it, so he's focusing in this section on the zaman, on sort of a temporal understanding, so the fleeting nature of the world. All right, This is the pure Qur'an al-Karim, the pure Qur'anic understanding. Right, So many ayat to karim on this topic. That you see the dunya as stationary and stable. But you see it as if it's still, it's stationary, it's stable. Whereas it is furiously marching by and rapidly running away from you. In other words, what they say in English, time is flying. But we view our lives in this world as static. And then he says that the person who looks at the dunya is unable to perceive its rapid movement, means it's rapidly moving away from you. So they are, and here comes the word, it mutmain, they are tranquil and sakin in it. They become stationary in it. And they only perceive the movement of the dunya when they lose something from it. So just imagine that something is like going at high speed and it's going to pass by you and then you're going to lose it. But you don't realize it's moving at high speed because you're staring at it so intently. You're staring at it so intently it seems that it is still and you are still and then a flash of a second it disappears. But actually it didn't disappear all of a sudden in a flash. It was moving at high speed. Hmm? So like us, we didn't all, nobody all of a sudden turns 30, 40, and 50. You were moving at constant velocity towards those ages. Nobody actually all of a sudden dies suddenly. They were moving at a constant velocity, 24 hours a day at a time. Everybody moves at the same, exact same speed and velocity towards Mot. But we didn't realize it. We didn't realize this motion. Okay, another example it gives. That the dunya is like the zil is like the shadow. It appears to be stationary, but in reality it is in motion. And its motion cannot be grasped with the vision of the eye, but it can only be grasped through the vision of the heart. So by vision of the heart, what he means is your inner discernment, your faculty of comprehension, right? This is a very important thing. This is why Islam does not only believe in empiricism because we believe that Allah SWT has given us a knowledge in the Quran Kareem through revelation and through the Sunnah of Nabi Kareem to make us understand truth in reality deeper, deeper 
than that which can be perceived merely by the eye or by the rational intellect. Right? So just think of the example of the eye. When you see something, like you see the sun, this is another example that we use, it looks like it's just the size of a quarter or a dime or a coin. Right? But you have a deeper understanding that makes you realize the empirical experience is not true. The same thing, I mean, science accepts this part, right? The same thing that I just said about the eye, Dean says this about the rational intellect also. That's the difference between Islam and empiricism. Islam says yes, what, uh, sorry, empiricism says yes, that what you observe may not always be true, but you have appealed to a higher authority, which is the akal. Islam says you have an appeal to a higher authority, which is the akal, and then you have a further appeal to the highest authority, which is the ilm, and actually it is the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he taught you. Allam al-insana ma'lam ya'lam. That sacred knowledge that is in wahi. And I, if anything, I think that is extremely true about the dunya. That even our rational mind cannot comprehend the truth and reality of the dunya. The only thing that will enable us to understand the dunya is the verses from Quran Kareem and the teachings of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, now I want to move to some hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Last time we had done the, one of the most often recited hadith on this topic. Kun fi dunya ka anna ka gharib o abir sabil So this is the hadith uh, in the Sahih of Imam, uh, Imam Muslim Allah Ta'ala. Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that this world is uh, sweet and luscious. I mean sweet, luscious, verdant. Uh, and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make you his successors, uh, rather his na'ib, his representatives in the dunya, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assess how you behave. And then Nabi Kareem sallallahu warned, it was initially to the Sahaba, but it's for the whole ummah, when the dunya was given in this way to the Bani Israel, in other words, they were made the na'ib uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth in their time. So when the world was made, uh, accessible to the Bani Israel in this way, they lost themselves in ornamentation, women, fragrance, and clothing. Okay, by women it's not a gender thing, but it means they lost themselves in, let's say, attraction to the opposite gender. That's what the, here the word women means. But because initially, obviously, when the Karim Salaam said many of these hadith, it was an all-male Sahaba audience in front of him, just like today even. If a person is talking in a gathering of just men and they want to explain the concept of uh, lust, they may say the word women, but it's, a, it's, a, it's true for both genders. So they lost themselves in ornamentation. Okay, So these are four now delusions we're going to have to cover uh, from uh, the hadith of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That may be all we can manage to do today. Uh, so at least we got one major uh, verse of Quran Kareem. And one hadith of Nabi Akareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, the first thing is ornamentation, zinat. All right. Zinat here uh, can mean your own ornamentation in terms of dress and appearance and all of that. But it, what it also means is, I put, I'm going to sort of put it in more modern terms, your house and your car. Where this is the ultimate zinat that a person has. It doesn't mean that you should not have dwelling it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a car alhamdulillah i think all of us myself and all of you alhamdulillah has blessed us maybe we don't own but we rent you have a residence and you have an auto all right but if you view this as your zenith what does that mean so zenith means that you think that this beautifies you in some way right it beautifies you in some way it increases your worth this was the Mm, the word I'd used for you earlier. It increases your worth, your value. It makes you more beautiful. 
That is a mistake. There is nothing in this dunya that is a delusion. There is nothing in this dunya that if you have it, that is purely just of the dunya, there is no material worldly possession. No matter how noble, beautiful it may be, the most beautiful car, the most beautiful home, the most beautiful carpet, the most beautiful sweater, the most beautiful watch, nothing in this dunya that if you have it or you have even all of it, that it in any way increases your beauty, even in the slightest drop. So really, if you look at this, this is the delusion, right? If you look at the Western culture, which is not global, what they call the global monoculture of makeup and fashion and society and modeling and magazines and celebrities, what are they doing, right? What is it? You, in, influencers, right? It, it, they think that this outward beauty or maybe their physical beauty, or the, the cars, or the lavish lifestyle, all of that, they think their own value and worth lies in that. Al-Aman hmm? al-Hafiz. You know, I once, several years ago, when I was in an academic program, uh, there was a Turkish woman, uh, Muhajaba, and she was writing her dissertation on what she called the bourgeoisie hijabi women. So this was some, apparently in some suburbs of Istanbul or Ankara maybe. I, I don't want to, I'm not sure about the details. I can't remember anymore. It's been over 10 years. But it was basically that there were some very, she was basically documenting uh, a very materialistic uh, lifestyle where, you know, just very large houses, very fancy cars, very fancy clothing, etc., etc. But yes, uh, they were wearing hijab. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all those women for wearing the hijab. And may Allah ta'ala rescue us and them from any and all delusions. Uh, but I'm just giving that example. I'm not in any way suggesting all Turkish women, because this is not the majority of uh, muhajibas anywhere in the world or in Turkey. But it's an example to show that, yes, the hijab, that simple piece of cloth, actually that increases their zenith their value and their beauty in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala infinitely to the level of trillions and trillions and infinitely beyond that. Whereas all the millions of material possessions in the car and the bag and whatever it is uh, does not do anything for a person. Does not make them any more beautiful or valued in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first thing, zinat. The second thing is Let's call it unlawful attraction and interaction with the opposite gender. What happens here is that generally this is observed in human history as well as contemporary times that what the more power and wealth a person has, the more they want to have the entitlements that are available to people of power and wealth. That's why they say power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's why they say in Urdu, they would say dolat, orat, and shohrat, which meant that wealth and then the ability to engage in, from either gender's perspective, from in, in lustful pleasures due to that wealth, and then fame and prestige, again due to that wealth. So this is the second sin, second delusion of this world. right? Now again, we are not saying that a person should be, just pause here on these two, that a person should be entirely ascetic, have no happiness in this world. That's not what we're saying. What the deen is saying is that whatever happiness you seek in this world, number one, it should be within the sharia. Number two, you should view that happiness as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, you should view that happiness as fleeting, ephemeral, temporary, fleeing and fleeting away from you. And number four, you should know that that worldly, if it's a purely material, worldly, physical happiness, does not increase your worth in terms of your journeying towards the Akhirah and seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next two things that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned in this hadith would seem to maybe the contemporary, whatever, 21st century, 15th century Hijri Muslim to be relatively minor, fragrance and clothing, right? And on the one hand, we also have other hadith that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa one of the three things he loved was fragrance. And we also know 
that Nabi Akram sallallahu alaihi wasallam had a particular, you know, uh, libas in which it was very loose and double covering, as I tell the men and for the women also, very flowing loose libas. So, what does it mean here that they lost themselves in fragrance and clothing? It's very easy to understand in the modern world, right? How I think I think even Allah what the stat would be, but I think confident, fairly confidently. That if 10%, just 10% of the amount that was spent in the world a year on perfume and cologne and on fashion and clothing for people who had enough clothing to wear in their closet, so I'm talking about the extra, if just 10% of that was spent, you could fix all of poverty, you could cure all of illiteracy, you could cure all famine, you could, etc. You could provide access to education for all. Yes, literally, if you start, if you sometimes look at these statistics, uh, you would be shocked at how much spending there is, right? And, you know, all of us, mashallah, alhamdulillah, we try when there's an earthquake somewhere, a flood somewhere, or there, you know, we find out that people are collecting clothes, and you go through your closet, and you're, you'll be amazed how many extra clothes you actually do have. How many even extra new clothes, tagged, completely unworn clothes some people have, right? Uh, so we get lost in the world. So here, this may seem like a minor thing, but often I feel that if you find something that you feel to be minor, you should be very happy. Because if it's minor, it's something, a small step you can take. And believe me, you try to give those clothes away, you will feel it. People who... Some people, not everybody's like this, but some people, when they go through the closet, rationally speaking, they could probably give 80% of what they have. But what happens, the best of them give away 20% of what they have. This is not a small thing. This is what we explain this one elsewhere. Mayuka shuha nafsihi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explain in Quran that that person has this last minute greed, right? Which is when they have already made the niya and irada, the intention that they want to give something away. But the last minute, that covetousness, that desire to hoard and collect and keep and retain, they just can't let go, that is a sign of how attached we are to, this, to the things in this world. That we're so attached that we just can't let go, right? Or you lose some small thing and you feel sad because you lost it. So here, a lot has been written on this topic, a lot about the censure of the dunya, uh, and a lot about love for the dunya. Maybe I should just do that last one, Hubb dunya ra'su kulli khati'a, which is, you know, let's just say for now, without further uh, confirmed research, let's just say this is just a saying of one of the early pious Muslims, that love for the dunya is the source of all error. But because I want to talk about the first part, which is hubb dunya And a lot of us would suffer from this delusion that we don't think we love this world. And it happens a lot when you describe a sinful behavior, a feeling, a person says, no, no, I don't have that. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I don't have love for the world. I don't have love for money. I don't have love for wealth. I don't have love for fame. True, we might not have it in a very absolute, a very extreme evil sense, but a lot of us have all of the above, but just maybe in lesser amounts. And they're not trace negligible amounts, they're enough. They're significant enough that they are obstructing our traveling this path of Sirat al Mustaqim. And it's a delusion. And yes, I, I'm not. This is no one thing in Islam will fix all of your Islam, except the truth of the fazl and karam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't mean necessarily if, um, inshallah, all of us, we try to be better on the things that we shared today, that that alone will suffice for our entire deen. No. The entire deen suffices for your entire deen. This is why there's so many topics. This is why there's so many teachings. This is why there's so many... Verses in Quran al-Kareem, so many hadith of Nabi al-Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why the Islamic scholarly tradition and spiritual tradition can fill vast libraries. Because the entire deen, udkhulu fi silmi kafa, you have to enter the entire deen for that, it, and only the entire deen can suffice you. That has to be your attitude. 
Maybe we'll end on this. That that has to be your attitude or dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want it all. I want to understand all of Quran al -Kareem. I want to practice all of Quran al -Kareem. I want to feel all of Quran al -Kareem. If you look at that standard, we're nowhere, nowhere near that. We're nowhere near that how, no matter how many years, 20, 30 years you've been doing this. I want to understand all of the sunnah. I want to live all of the sunnah. I want to feel all of the sunnah. I want to have all of the virtuous akhlaq. I want to rid myself of all of the bad akhlaq. That is called deen. That is called deen. And that's a lifetime. That's the, this is the purpose of our life. We have been given a lifetime. So now here, let's look at this big. We've been given a lifetime. What? To try to learn and practice the entire deen entirely. And yes, to, if that is the mission, to learn and practice the entire deen entirely, you need, you and I need an entire lifetime. But then look at us, what are we spending our lifetime on? Can I say I've spent my entire lifetime to entirely learn and practice deen? Hmm? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us, inshaAllah. I'm going to put myself on the spot just to make myself do it. So for two years, actually, I have been planning to start a course this September. I had put it in my mind to start it in fall 2023, two years ago, when the COVID restrictions were mostly lifted. And I thought I would give myself two years. I had to give myself two years for many family academic reasons and also just to sort of understand America. But uh, I'm, inshallah, uh, forcing myself to launch the first part of this course on Thursday, September 21st, inshallah. So now I say inshallah, and I, by saying this loud, loud to you, I'm now trying to make a commitment only for the sake of holding myself to that commitment. This course represents what I feel uh, a person should learn. Because I want to learn it and relearn it and better learn it, I thought the best way to do that would be for me to teach it. It's not because I'm one person, I have all the understanding of deen, but I, like I told you just now, I, like all of us, I want to understand the deen. And so in my explorations of that, uh, and it's always helped me to understand things by teaching them. Uh, so this is a very long project I have, uh, but I'm going to start one part of that inshallah on Thursday September 21st and by forcing myself to say this I'm inshallah forcing myself to do it after these two years inshallah so hopefully we will try to share with you somehow through some form uh, what that will be and how to enroll and that it's going to be free alhamdulillah inshallah uh, I'm only calling it a course because it's a uh, khair I will when, when inshallah in the first session of that I'll explain that in more detail uh, and that is just one of many, many efforts. And uh, all of you are actually responsible. Uh, I'm not responsible to teach the entire deen to anyone except myself. But all of you are responsible to try to learn the entire deen from whoever and whomsoever. And it will be multiple ways, multiple forms, multiple media, books, talks, reflections, gatherings, in person, online, any of the above, some of the above, all of the above. But all of you are individually responsible to learn, at least try, trying to learn as much, let's say, of the entire deen as much as you can, and then to live and practice and feel the entire deen as much as you can. Uh, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the reason I say this is that because really, uh, that's the only thing that can protect a person from the delusion of the world. This is just my experience. I'm not saying necessarily this is the ultimate Islamic truth. But I have found in my own life and in the lives of almost, I would say yes, everyone probably I have encountered with over these past 30 years for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the sake of deen, is unless you are wholeheartedly committed to a very dedicated, constant, consistent effort to trying to learn and practice the entire deen, unless you're doing that, then dunya will ensnare you. It will get you one way or the other. It will get you in more than one way. And you won't realize, this is what I said, delusion. You won't realize and then you will slip into dunya, what they call a slippery slope, 
And you, even despite your knowledge, despite your ilm, despite your dawa, despite your dhikr, despite your khidma, despite anything and everything that you have done, and even if you had done that for years or decades, the dunya is never tires. It's just waiting for you to slip and fall in its trap. It has laid traps and snares and nets at every single moment and step of your life from now until moat. That is what the dunya is. So we make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah ta'ala enable us to correctly, deeply, truly understand the dunya. May Allah ta'ala grant us the hasanat of the dunya, which I didn't talk about today, but is a topic. May Allah ta'ala grant us all that is noble and virtuous in dunya. In other words, all that enables us to worship Him, obey Him, remember Him, submit to Him, and enables us to emulate and practice the uswat hasana, the beautiful model and life of Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may Allah ta'ala save us from every slight misstep in the dunya, every catastrophic pitfall of the dunya. May Allah ta'ala protect us, our heart, from feelings of radhan itminan for the hayat dunya and may Allah Ta'ala grant us in our heart all of our radha and all of our itminan for His sake and in His name and upon His deen and in His obedience. And may Allah Ta'ala protect us from every form of ghafla, from being unaware or from being aware and uncaring. Wa akhir da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Inshallah we ask all of you to remember us in du'as. And we make dua for all of you, inshallah. And hopefully you will hear from us again uh, on Thursday, September 21st, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.